Welcome to First Unitarian Church of Wilmington, Delaware. My name is James Moser. I'll be your worship associate this morning. I welcome you who are viewing us online and those of you gathered here in the sanctuary, and most especially we welcome our children this morning. Glad you're here. We'll hear more from the children in just a moment. First Unitarian's identity is founded upon being a welcoming community. We welcome diversity of folks with wide varying backgrounds and interesting views of faith. If you would like to find out more about First U, we invite you to go online to our website where you can sign up for our weekly e-newsletter. This afternoon at three o'clock, a very special event will happen right here where you are sitting, and that will be an organ concert given by Daniel Carroll, an up and coming and very accomplished young organist. That will be at three o'clock and will be followed by a social time at which opportunity you may meet, young Daniel. While our service today is mostly a familiar one uh, in its flow and content, uh, there will be one unusual event at the end, after Reverend Larry offers his sermon on one anothering, we will end the service with a safety drill. Uh, on your seats this morning in the sanctuary, you received a little flyer that will give you the basic information you need to know. Uh, that safety drill will be following the very last hymn and will explain the details at that time. Uh, but bear in mind that our refreshments will not be in the back room today. They will be outside uh, uh, in the garden area and um, the Weather Channel convinced me that the forecast is favorable for us to do that. Now let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship. As, as the children come up, we're going to sing one of our favorite hymns, So they will sing it first, and then we will sing it second. If you don't know what it's him to 
for 123 and the hip goes underneath your seat. That was just wonderful. No, that, oh, that can stay there. It's fine. It's fine right there. So, good morning. I'm the Reverend Larry Pierce. Now, I might not sound like myself uh, because I've had a cold this week, but uh, I'm just as excited and enthused as I always am to be with you. <laughs> so, our opening words... Welcome all who seek renewal in a weary world. Welcome all who come with love and energy to share. Welcome to those who worry for the future. Welcome each one who is grateful for today. Know that in this place, you are not alone. In community, we share our strength with one another, and we keep the flame of love burning bright. Know that in this place, responsibility is shared. Here, tradition holds us, ancestors shine a light from the past, and here the young lift their bright faces and beckon us onward. Take my hand, and we can go on together. This morning... <clears throat> Excuse me. For our chalice lighting, I want to invite Casey and Kingston to come forward. <clears throat> if you have a chalice at home, I invite you to light it with us as I offer these words and our young people light our flame. Our chalice reminds us that the fire within ourselves is the same fire that illuminates the universe. It is our reminder that all is connected even though the space of the void is vast and our experience here is but a short blip in the cosmic timeline. 
Thank you, boys. Now, please rise as you are able and join the singing of The Lone Wild Bird, number 15, and please remain standing afterwards for our affirmation. Please join me in affirming our mission. First Unitarian Church of Wilmington is the beloved community that nourishes minds and spirits, fights injustice, and transforms the world through loving action. I'd like to invite the Barlow family to come forward, please. <coughs> and is Finn's grandmother here? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you. That's good. From the beginning of time, families have brought their children to be dedicated to communities of love and hope. Today, we acknowledge that this community shares a responsibility to a new child in our midst. Rob and Sarah, as parents of this child, what name have you given him? Finnegan. Finnegan. As parents, you are your children's first teacher, and you covenant today to raise him in faith and in love. In presenting your child at this service, you also invite all of us to share some of the joy and responsibility that is yours as parents. Your task may not always be an easy one, but I think you know that already. <laughs> the time may come when you will need to set aside your own dreams, ambitions, and pleasures so that your child may tread more surely the onward path of life. But you accept this service to another life, knowing that your own lives will be fuller and richer in consequence. Parents, in your covenant with the child you present today, you will instill in your child your shared commitment to service, respect for others, an appreciation of truth and beauty, a desire for peace, and a generosity in forgiveness. And you will covenant with those gathered here to seek our support and share in your joy of remembering that as parents, you are never alone. If so, please say, we will. We will. <laughs> and today, a grandparent, just raise your hand so we can locate you. <laughs> Lorraine McDevitt is present with us. Hi, Lorraine. Lorraine, are you willing to help Finn grow in wisdom and strength so that he may discover his own values and dreams and destiny? If so, please say, I will. I will. <laughs> Great, Lorraine. 
And now to the congregation. To the congregation of this church with which these parents have come to feel a kinship and which they find a home. Will you, the congregation, enter into covenant with this family to share in the collective responsibility for Finn, nurturing him and supporting his religious education in our Unitarian Universalist faith? And if so, please say, we will. We will. This child has an older sibling, Benjamin. Benjamin and the children of our congregation, you have a particular responsibility. And so I have some questions for you. Will you please come forward and stand in front of Finn's family? Okay, there's good. You can, you're going to face Finn okay. because it's Finn with whom you're making the covenant. So, children of our congregation, you have a particular responsibility. And so I have some questions for you. As Finn grows up, he will look up to you, older children. Will you be a friend to him? Will you speak to him with kindness and treat him with fairness? Will you show him the best that is in you and help him to find the best that is in him? If so, please say, we will. We will. Okay, you may go back to your seats. This is the part with the flower I told you about, right? Then, with this flower, I touch your feet so that you may stand against injustice. I touch your hands so that you may reach for and grasp great wisdom. I touch your ears so that you might hear music and sacred silences. I touch your eyes so that you may see beauty in every living thing. I touch your lips so that you may speak the truth. And finally, I touch your heart so that you may know love and give love abundantly, openly, and courageously. Mm. And this okay, flower is for you. Yeah, and thank you. So, this is exciting, isn't it? You should do this every Sunday. So, with this water, I bless you, Finn. <laughs> you are a beloved child. You are a miracle of this world. We will learn more from you than we could ever teach you. May you follow in the paths of your family, respecting all religions, and drawing from the inspirations of our Unitarian Universalist faith. May you always remember your connection with all of nature and with all that has ever been. May your life be filled with love and may it be rich with laughter. May you always know your own holiness, like water, can never be destroyed. Finn, you are blessed and you are loved. Yeah. <laughs> we present to you Finn Barlow. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And now we will sing our children out. The words will be on the screen. If the children will please wait for me at the door.
each, there we go. each Sunday we take time to attend to the concerns and the joys of our individual and collective hearts. We know we live in a world in which there are too many tears in too many places. We know that we live in a world in which joy, like rain, can refresh us. So let's take a moment now and think about what are those particular concerns that we have in three areas. One, concerns for our own lives, concerns for those we love, and concerns for the world. So I will light a candle for each one of those, and after I've lit the candle, I invite you to share something in each of those categories. So first of all, I light this candle to represent those concerns that we have for ourselves. What might those be? And you may speak them aloud in this room, or if you're joining us online, you may write them in the chat. I have a concern for myself that I can't sit still for too many days being sick at home, so I hope this is like turning the corner. <laughs> Just say yes, Larry. Yes. yes. Okay. Anyone else have a concern for themselves? So we hold these concerns you have for yourself as tender as a flame is held by the candle. And now I light this candle to represent the concerns that we have for our loved ones, those that we are connected with one way or another. What are the concerns that you might be holding for someone else? Speak those aloud in this room or write them in the chat. And finally, I light this candle for the concerns that we have for our world. What are those concerns that you are holding? Indeed, there are so many places in the world that tug at our heart, that call forth our compassion and our care. May all of these candles represent for us the warmth of these candles and the light of these candles represent for us the joy that wants to break through in our own lives and maybe even now is beginning to break through in some tiny way that you've begun to recognize. So what joys might you be holding? So we hold together both concerns and joys, knowing that we need not hold anything alone, but that we are upheld and supported by one another and by a love that is greater than us all. Amen. Join in singing when you feel ready.
as humans, we are wired for connection. I really knew that this week when I had to spend a lot of time alone at home. But most often, however, there is a relentlessness to the human spirit that propels us. And in spite of any apparent obstacles to find ways to connect and to express ourselves to one another, identified so much with those videos during the pandemic of people in Italy who, even though they were quarantined, went out to their balconies and sang songs to one another into the open skies. The urge to connect is a powerful one. And there is also a quiet, prevalent longing that doesn't find its way out onto the balcony sometimes. And more and more, we are becoming aware of what the U.S. Surgeon General in a 2020 report called our epidemic of loneliness and isolation. Now, you might not have thought of loneliness as a pandemic, as something pervasive enough to warrant the word pandemic, or epi epidemic, I should have said. Yet through extensive research across many disciplines, medicine, public health, psychology, sociology, the evidence exists that loneliness and isolation is indeed a health issue that impacts all areas of our well-being, our physical health, our mental health, and our sustaining health practices. Moreover, our communities are impacted by the epidemic of loneliness. Our active participation in our civic and political arenas is impacted, and our spirits are impacted as well by the prevalence of loneliness that oftentimes does not speak its name. The issue of loneliness has often not been discussed or acknowledged, and it is the aim of the Surgeon General and all who participated in this multi-year study to call us forward as individuals, families and schools, communities, social agencies, medical facilities, and even congregations to own our collective responsibility and participation in the healing effects of social connection and community. That means that we too may be experiencing loneliness, that we too may also be part of the healing power of connection. Both may be true about any of us. I personally feel that we have to make this issue discussable, and that's why I'm bringing it up today. We, only think, we often think of loneliness only as an individual concern requiring only individual responsibility. However, it is much more than that. The research shows that we have become more and more isolated over time so that we need to understand Loneliness is a major public health concern, and I believe one worthy of our religious concern. Loneliness requires social responses and not just individual ones. It's been said that loneliness is a universal human experience like hunger or thirst. It is a natural signal that something is missing in our lives, and in this case, it might be human connection. While everyone experiences loneliness, some people are more susceptible to acute or chronic loneliness. Loneliness and social isolation impacts young adults at significant rates, and loneliness impacts older adults at significant rates as well, according to this research. Yet it also impacts children and people of every age and every stage of life in ways that we are only just beginning to understand. 
Dr. Jerry, Jeremy Noble, a primary care physician, a public health practitioner, and actually a poet, in his book, Project Unlonely, Healing Our Crisis of Disconnection, echoes many of the findings that uh, are referred to in the Surgeon General's report on loneliness and social isolation. Dr. Noble says that to raise awareness of loneliness and its neg negative physical and mental effects, to destigmatize loneliness, and to make programming available to address loneliness are the aims that he's dedicated his own work towards. Such aims, I believe, are worthy of our collective efforts as well. Now, you already know, because I've expressed this from the pulpit a number of times already, that I have a concern that some of the overwhelm that many of us are experiencing today may also lead us to feelings of inevitability about the political, the social, the ecological crisis of our time. In the face of such enormity and the added unnecessary, incendiary, out of control and distracting drama of the political arena, I have a few opinions about this. <laughs> we and or many of us may know may be tempted to withdraw, to isolate, to hibernate until the dust settles in November. But we can't. We have to be there for one another, even now. I've called us to stay awake and awakened when the tactics that are documented to keep us confused, overwhelmed, mistrusting of news sources and of government can lead us to a sense of powerlessness and further isolation rather than action, collective action, toward the common good. So I address this epidemic of loneliness as a human concern of our time, and in particular, a concern that can have more dire consequences at a time when more engagement is most needed. In fact, Judy Gavatos, how do I say your name? Gavatos, yeah, always mispronouncing it, but everyone who knows about this candy store is always correcting me. <laughs> uh, and I are launching a centering group today that we hope can become an ongoing way for us to stay spiritually grounded and engaged during the months ahead as one expression of how we might continually encourage our civic engagement along also providing collective spiritual support. That group's first meeting today is for about 30 minutes in the chapel at 1215. Please join us if you'd like. In the face of this epidemic of loneliness, we need to continue to show up for ourselves and one another. Show up for the wider community of Wilmington boldly and forthrightly. We need to be here for one another. And that is why my reflections today are entitled, A Call to One Anothering. Well, I didn't feel like a sermon title, The Epidemic of Loneliness, would really draw a crowd. <laughs> So I thought an intriguing title like The Call to One Anothering might get a few people to show up. At the same time that we make loneliness and social isolation discussable, I believe there can be a hopeful message in our turning our attention in that direction. Many years ago, uh, when I lived in Boston, a lot of days I'd walk through the Boston Public Garden particularly on spring days when there were tulips out and the trees were flowering. And there, standing in a prominent gate place in the garden, right near one of the main gates, there's a statue honoring a Unitarian minister, the Reverend Edward Everett Hale. He lived from 1822 to 1909. And on the base of that statue are inscribed Hale's motto, it reads, look up and not down. Look out and not in. Look forward and not back. Lend a hand. 
I've imbibed these words over the years. Hale believed in these words so much, he modeled them in the way that he engaged with the community around him. And it's in Hale's spirit that I believe as a Unitarian Universalist religious community that we dare to look at tough issues that impact human well-being and the common good and ask, what is our religiously human response? What is our particularly religious human response to the epidemic of loneliness? So in order to formulate a refined response to this epi epidemic of loneliness, we need to define some terms first. First, there are these terms social connection and loneliness. Social connection and loneliness are related, but they're not the same. Social isolation is objectively having few social relationships, social roles, group memberships, and infrequent social interactions. On the other hand, loneliness, as defined in the report, is a subjective internal state. It's the distressing experience that results from perceived isolation or unmet needs between an individual's preferred and actual experience. Note that social isolation is external. It's actual availability of avenues for social connection in the communities around us or our actual engagement with these opportunities. Loneliness is more of an internal experience. It's the gap between what we prefer and what we are actually experiencing in terms of our connection with others. Now, just to be clear, solitude is different than loneliness. Solitude is a state of aloneness by choice that does not involve feeling lonely. Solitude can be very helpful to our spirits. It can be a personal practice, very distinct from loneliness. So why does social connection matter? I turn to the findings of the report, which actually cites over 140 studies over a multi-year period focusing on social isolation and loneliness. Don't worry, I'm not gonna review all the studies. The report says, a lack of social connection poses a significant risk for individual health and longevity. Loneliness increases the risk of premature death by 26%. Social isolation increases the risk for premature death by 29%. To put this into perspective, the report adds that poor or insufficient social connection is associated with increased risk of disease, including a 29% incre increased risk of heart disease, a 32% increase of the risk of stroke, and also this lack of social connection can increase the risk of anxiety, depression, and dementia. Surveys have found that approximately half of the U.S. adults report experiencing loneliness, with some of the highest rates, surprisingly, but maybe not surprisingly, being those among young adults. Yet less than 20% of the individuals who are often or always feel lonely or isolated recognized it as a major problem. Of course, the experience of loneliness is along a continuum. It's a matter of degree at any particular time. It's not a simple yes or no response. Social connectedness changes over time as the report say, states. Transient feelings of loneliness may be less problematic or even adaptive because the distressing feeling motivates us to reconnect socially. Does that make sense to you? Say yes or no. You do, you do, you do know I read eyelashes. I know which movements mean yes, which means no, but we gotta move along. Similarly, temporary experiences of solitude may help us to manage social demands. However, chronic loneliness, even if someone is not socially isolated, 
and isolation, even if someone is not lonely, represents a significant health concern. We could refine our understanding of social isolation a little further by looking at three components, structure, function, and the quality of our connections. So let's do that uh, briefly. Each of, of these are, are worth our considering. What is the structure of our social connections. Structure is defined by the number of relationships and the variety of relationships and the frequencies of interactions that we have with others. What is the function of our social connections? Function is defined as the degree to which others can be relied upon for various needs. And what is the quality of our social connections. Quality is defined as the degree to which relationships and interactions with others are positive, helpful, or satisfying versus negative, unhelpful, or unsatisfying. And so I think these distinctions allow us to assess for ourselves or for others what area do we want to make adjustments? Is it in the structure, the number, of interactions we have, it is in the function, uh, the degree which others can be relied upon, or is in the quality of our relations. One of the significant and relevant points in the report and the subsequent writing of the, on the subject is that loneliness and social connection is more than a personal issue. The social infrastructure of a community is more than individual. It includes the physical aspects of a community, such as li libraries, parks, programs, volunteer and membership organizations, and public transportation and housing that supports the development of social connection. So we begin to see that it becomes a societal response and not just a personal one. Moreover, the social infrastructure is influenced by broader social policies, cultural norms, and technology, the political and macroeconomic factors. So the social infrastructure, that is what's actually available to people within a community, is also influenced by the degree of cooperation, discrimination, inequality, and the collective social connectedness or disconnectedness of the community. So, we sometimes are confused by thinking being connected is what we do on technology, by using technology. Certainly, technology with all of its benefits, allowing for connection, may also inhibit it. Americans spend an average of six hours per day on digital media. I'm not looking at anyone in particular. I'm just, looking, <laughs> I'm just looking out at the crowd. One in three U.S. adults, 18 and over, report that they are online almost constantly. And, almost, and among 13 to 17-year-olds, this number who are online almost constantly has doubled since 2015. The dangers of this are the following. This high level number of hours, number of engagements online, displace in-person engagement, oftentimes. Oftentimes it monopolizes our attention so that even if we are there with others, we're not even there with them, if you know what I mean. It reduces the quality of our interaction with others. It can even diminish our own self-esteem because everyone boasts about things online and we might not feel as both boastful at a particular moment. All of which can lead to greater loneliness and a reduced social connection. So the task before us is to build a culture of connection, 
a culture that cultivates values of kindness, respect, service, and commitment to one another, what I'm calling one anothering. The task before us is to model the values of connection for one another, to expand the conversation on social connection in our schools, our workplaces, our hospitals, and I would also add our congregations. So what Dr. Noble adds to the extensive research in the U.S. Surgeon General's report are various personal testimonies of lonely people of every age, background, and circumstances. And what Dr. Noble does is to share his discovery that the pandemic isolated us in ways that were not only physical and that are at its core a true sense of loneliness results from a disconnection to the self. He clarifies how meaningful connection can be nourished and sustained. And he reveals that an important component of the healing process is engaging in creativity. Those of you interested in creativity and art and other things may want to Google his website on the Unloneliness Project, and you'll see a variety of activities that one can do alone or with others to kind of stimulate that creativity that allows us to connect to ourselves, but also to connect to others. So having read these, this material on loneliness, I was searching for a pathway that we could engage in as individuals and a religious community to respond intentionally and directly to this loneliness epidemic. And what I've concluded is that we are already doing much, of, as a congregation, already doing much of what we need to do. We just need to understand that we have a specific calling in our time, calling for one anothering. We just need to understand that we can orient what we do to be part of this essential healing force to address the psychological and the social and the existential lo loneliness using the resources and the programs that we already have available at the First Unitarian Church of Wilmington and to use them in intentional ways, not just for ourselves alone, but for the sake of the health of the greater Wilmington community as well. Gone are the days that we think of Unitarian Universalist congregation as merely a refugee camp for religious refugees. Or the Unitarian Universalist congregation as a secret club with confusing acronyms that only some people know and others don't. We need to understand ourselves as a vital resource within the wider community that are, we need to understand that we are upholding values and embodying practices that are so desperately needed for the health of our broader community and not for ourselves alone. My hope, my prayer, is that we can hear the call to one anothering, be there for one another, and see our work as for ourselves, but also for one another. So may it be. The lights are on, the doors are open, the atmosphere is hopefully comfortable, and here we are. Somebody pays for all that. That's us. As a community, we not only have an obligation to maintain a physical plant and our programs, not only an obligation, but I would encourage you to think of it, that is, your gift, as an act of faith. To give is an act of faith. It means you believe in something. 
It means you belong to something. So this is going to be brief, and as a matter of fact, that's about it. Your giving is an act of faith. You'll have an opportunity uh, to examine the means by which you may make a gift to First You on the screen uh, during the music that follows. And you can do that, uh, make that gift in a variety of ways, as you will see. For now, as we uh, profess our faith in our affirmation of mission, uh, we also profess our faith uh, in our stewardship statement. And I enjoy, uh, invite you to join me now in our dedication of offering to the work of this congregation, which is weaving a tapestry of love and action, we dedicate our lives and these our offerings. If you have a chalice at home and you have lighted it earlier, uh, we invite you to extinguish it now with us in the sanctuary with these words. Our chalice reminds us that the fire within ourselves is the same fire that illuminates the universe. It is our reminder that all is connected and we carry a flame forth even though our ceremonial flame is extinguished. Uh, so, although I could look forward to having a child dedication every Sunday, it's only occasionally that we have a fire drill. <laughs> so, you've been forewarned. Those are the doors you go out across the street, and then when the bell rings, uh, you'll hear a bell to evacuate quietly and calmly. Those of you who need assistance, hopefully we've provided that help already. It's available. And, uh, and then we'll gather uh, in the garden area right over here for our fellowship time after the service, right out the, uh, those doors. If you're visiting us today for the first time, there's a woman who has a yellow cape. She's standing up now. She's very shy, but there she is. <laughs> She's available to connect you with others and also... People at our, uh, our welcome table will be glad to answer, and anyone in the room will be glad to answer any questions you have about First Unitarian Church of Wilmington. So I'd like you to repeat these words from Edward Everett Hale after me. Look up and not down. Look, up and not down. Look out and not in. Look out and not in. 
Look forward and not back. Lend a hand. And before we sing our closing hymn, Draw the Circle Wide, I think the words will appear on the screen. Look at the person to your right and then to your left and say, we need, say, we need one another. We need one another. We need one another. Let's sing, Draw the Circle Wide. service, which actually we've reached. Um, soon you will hear an air horn or a bell. Oh, it's a bell. Thank goodness. Uh, Reverend Larry found the bell. We can retire the air horn. Uh, what we'll do is please quickly but orderly uh, exit the sanctuary. Everyone by those doors back there that lead you to the narthex and then out the doors uh, toward Whitby. Cross Whitby carefully, look out for one another, and gather on the far side of the street. Consider this a lab experiment in one anothering. <laughs> Meanwhile, your children will be exiting 
out of the education wing to the parking lot where they will remain until the drill is over. You may then meet your children uh, after we've been dismissed outside and then gather in the garden next to the office entrance uh, for a social time and something to slake your thirst then. Uh, if you need assistance with the evacuation, uh, don't worry, someone will help you. Um, someone will help you. There it is. She's not free. <laughs>